I'd like to try to talk to you, though. All right, where we left off was with reliability. The main thing I want you to think about is reliability. I just It just happened again. I know why. I'm not using this correctly. If I did pen, this is... Hey, look at that. I got a pen now. All right, look out, look out, world. Uh, reliability, if you've got this total, it's asking what proportion, this is the total variation right here. What proportion of the total variation is due to variation in the score itself? And the person's true value of happiness. So this is what I was talking about with this drawing before. If you had no measurement error, then what you see in terms of your distribution of happiness is really happiness. That's totally 100% of the variation of happiness is due to true, the true score itself. Uh, but likely that's not the case. So here is uh, what happens. If we were to come up with our dependent variable, it's the sum of all of our items. And so when we do that, it kind of brings up the discussion of multivariable statistics. Also fun, but the big picture of it is, you're familiar with correlation, I take it? The correlation is how co how related two variables happen to be. Are you familiar with co co uh, correlations um, evil twin or evil stepchild covariance? Have you heard of it before? Covariance is correlation with units. Right? Correlation is correlation. It's unitless. It's just, it's a standardized coefficient. Covariance is unit full. It has units to it. It's unstandardized. So the values of covariance are weird. We don't talk about them very often. We often when we talk about statistics or pairs of variables because they are weird. They're in the units of the variables they're talked about. Um, but we're going to talk about them a lot more because they show up in these multivariate distributions. Covariance is what we what runs the world essentially. Correlation is its little like marketing campaign. Do that like it's the front door to really association. But here's a correlation matrix for our five items. Correlations are somewhat low, looks like, huh? You know, I guess we have some 0.15s, you know, we have some that are a little bit negative. They're very small. Here's that formula for the correlation. As you know, correlation ranges from negative one to one, so long as you're using quantitative continuous variables. If you have variables that are categorical in nature, correlation does not is not guaranteed to go between negative one and one. It may be a smaller range. That will be problematic for us when we get to different data types in SEM. Um, so reliability, even though it's a proportion of variation, it's actually what we also talk about as a correlation. How correlated the true score is with the total score. Um, I'm not going to go dive into reliability. If you want to take reliability, there's a great course, 822. I don't know. You did reliability last year, right? A lot of the reliability? No? Nah? OK. Well, there's courses you can learn about reliability for. The bigger picture with, with you here is today, reliability is just, if it's, if it, is it perfectly reliable? Is it not perfectly reliable, right? But one of the ways that we measure reliability is something called the Kronbach Alpha. Have you heard of that before? Yep. What if I told you that Kronbach actually didn't start Kronbach's Alpha? Would you would you demand a recount or like did you feel kind of disappointed? It's actually a guy named Gutman. And so some of the books that you'll read actually call it Gutman Kronbach Alpha. So I'll call it Gutman Kronbach Alpha, just to be a little bit different. That's how I am. I like going the different path. You know, when I was a kid. Everybody wanted to play in or like the band, and I, w I was like, if everybody's doing band, I'm going to do orchestra, the strings. And then everybody in strings was doing violin. I was like, oh, if they're doing violin, nobody's doing cello, I'll do cello. So that's <laughs> that, just for that reason. And that's why I'm doing Gutman Chrome Back Alpha. <laughs> we, we need to ask Professor McKnight about Oh. Because it's, uh, he's his advisor. Oh, yeah? Was he? <laughs> well, he was whose advisor? Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, Kronbach was McKnight's advisor? Yeah. Oh, very nice. I bet he has a different opinion. <laughs> but Anyway, uh, you can talk about alpha in lots of ways, but let's think of it as the correlation between the true score and um, your observed score. And the other way you can think about it is uh, your index of reliability. If alpha is one, things are perfectly reliable, and that distribution of happiness is truly the happiness distribution. If it alpha is less than one, it's not reliable, uh, not perfectly reliable. 
we can actually compute it with covariance matrices. Covariances are these formulas right here. Uh, the covariance has a formula. Again, there's an n minus 1 and then n. We're going to use this one down here. But if you, a few slides back, I had a, re a correlation formula, and the core of it was this, this thing right here, the sum of the first variable minus its, its mean times the second variable minus its mean. This is sometimes called a cross product between variables. The covariance then, uh, if there is zero covariance, you get zero correlation. But covariance and correlation are tied together. So this covariance, S here, is described as having units. Uh, so it'll, it'll be a number. And actually, let's see if I can get an actual number. Here's a covariance. The covariance of uh, variable x1 with x2 is negative 0 0.074. That number looks like a correlation here, but it may not be. It may not always go from 0 to 1. In fact, it may have some really crazy units. That thing has units of variable x1 and units of variable x2. Right? So it's like Likert units 1, Likert units 2. It's this weird whatever. Um, covariance shows up all the time in SEM. And the reason for that is when we do our data for most of SEM, we make this assumption that our data or the errors for it are normal. And we have these multiple equations, so we end up getting this multivariate normal thing. The covariance matrix is part of that. It's literally part of the core of it. So it shows up a lot. Uh, and this is just to say it exists. We're going to get into it a little bit more in the next couple weeks, actually. Um, but it uh, correlation can be found from it. Right? So here's your covariance. Here's your correlation. It's right up here. If you want to take the covariance between two variables and find its correlation, you divide it by the standard deviation of the first times the standard deviation of the second. Likewise, if you have the correlation of two variables and you want to get the covariance, you multiply by the standard deviation of the first times the standard deviation of the second. What we're doing here, again, S capital S, when you have two things underneath, is um, a covariance. It's units of y1 times units of y2. There are some physical measurements. Uh, you can think of, like, um, the first one that pops in mind is torque. I don't know if you've heard of torque before. Um, torque is a measure, I want to say, of force in a uh, circular region. I, some of you may know better than I. I'm not a scientist of that type of scientist. Um, <laughs> It is measured, if you look at, it happens and talk about it in terms of engine, engine sizes, and it's, it's the, the kind of the camshaft that rotates and how fast and f how much force it rotates with, I believe, roughly speaking. Um, it's measured in something called pound feet in, in, in the, our, our met, imperial, imperial system of measurement. So it's pounds and feet together, which is really kind of a weird uh, describing description of torque, uh, what, what that number happens to be. It's two things together. So this is like that, right? There's two units to it, and in the correlation, we're actually, by dividing by the units of y1 and units of y2, we're essentially taking the units off. And so every correlation between variables has no units. That's why if you're using quantitative variables, the, ver the correlation has this range to it. Right? Actually dividing by the bounds to which covariance can be. So alpha my daughter always asks me, Dad, where does reliability come from? And I say, Daphne, it's right here. Kronbach's alpha formula is based on this covariance matrix. And I don't need to tell you all this, but I will just show you that our Kronbach's alpha for our data is 0.24. What? Is that a good reliability? Those of you intrepid people who do scales, no. That's like terrible. That's like all time bad, right? Horrific. But that didn't stop me from doing regression with our happiness scale. So that was to set up this. Why do we use structural equation modeling itself? What it is. So, um, not 100% reliable. What's the big deal? That's what basically people say. How many times have you seen people take a scale score and put it into a regression somewhere or an ANOVA somewhere? It happens all the time, right? Maybe not with a reliability of 0.24, but it does happen. Uh, but here's what happens when it's not perfectly measured, right? Your effects 
right? The regression coefficients, beta one, where all the hypotheses and all your story comes from, they may be biased, right? Remember bias? Oh, it's not a bad thing. We can always unbias it. Well, SCM is what we use to unbias it. Right. One way, one way to unbias it. But uh, so yeah, we, we end up seeing that our effects typically get downwardly biased. So if you have a regression slope, it looks like it's smaller than it really happens to be. And sometimes in regression class, you may have heard something about a, a, correct, a correction for disattenuation or some way of taking that slope and trying to unbias it. I don't know if you've seen that or heard about that before, but there's correction formula, and you could do that. But I think the combination is actually more lethal. The standard errors of that slope are also going to be biased. It says may there, but they really are. What that really means is that those standard errors are actually smaller than they really should be. Right? So what happens when you have standard errors that are smaller than they should be? Right? Think about the hypothesis test for that regression slope. We just did one about marital happiness. We did it using something called a Wald test, where we took the slope and divided it by the standard error. Right? If that standard error is too small, that test statistic gets very big. If the test statistic gets very big, you're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. Right? So if you use scaled variables, but you don't account for their unreliability, you actually it acts like you have more power than you really do. Right? You're more likely to reject the null hypothesis and a lot of those times, you probably shouldn't. That's where type 1 errors come in. So big picture is hypothesis tests may not be accurate. We've done one in this class so far. It was we concluded that people who are married have a different marital happiness, or happiness value than people who aren't. Could that be biased? It might be. So, so basically, any conclusions you make get drawn into question when you don't have 100% reliable variables in your analysis. Yeah. And the question then becomes just how reliable is reliable enough to be used, right? This is where you start hearing numbers. What's your favorite number for reliability of a scale? I don't know these things. Someone has to teach me. You learned this in class. What does reliability have to be? Anybody say that to anybody? Like point, eight. point 0.8. That's it. Why point 0.8? Where'd that come from? <laughs> That sounds just as arbitrary as 0.05, right? Yeah. And so I think the question is, how reliable is reliable enough? And actually, there are, when we get into uh, methods where we have our data aren't quite continuous, um, we'll find that reliable, there's no one reliability for your scale scores. A lot of you have taken a course called item response theory, and each, each value of the score has a different reliability, essentially, or may have a different reliability. So it gets even worse. This is saying every when we have this type of assumption now, every scale score has the same reliability. But if you use if you if you don't meet these assumptions, then you it's actually worse than this. It's, anyway, so so what the answer is? Don't use aggregated scores. Don't add stuff up if you can get away if you if you can avoid it. The answer should be use a structural equation model. All right, structural equation model. It's a big picture term. Uh, and I'll get to that little part later, but let's just go right now to say it try, it, a structural equation model is a model where you're trying to determine the relationship between things that you can't observe, latent constructs, right? So we have happiness. And if we had more than one, we may have a relationship between them. Maybe happiness predicts how outgoing you're going to be on a given day, right? Outgoingness would be another latent construct. Uh, we also have latent constructs and observed variables, right? So in our, it says observe constructs there, but let's just put the word variable. In fact, I'll just cross this out. Variable. A variable, you think of those five items that we had with the Likert scale. Each of one of those is a variable. And if we're saying each one of those measures happiness, we could, if, if we could observe a happiness score by itself directly, we could put it in a regression predicting how each person should respond to each item, right? That is the, the second part of SEM. It's called a measurement model. If you've done factor analysis before, it's actually a factor analysis. If you've done item response theory, it's no different. Um, it literally is, we are going to create a model where we simultaneously measure happiness and then use it in some other equation. Right? And so part of that is this relationship between happiness, the latent construct, and our happiness items, which are observed. So in this case, we don't need a score. We just need to come up with the overall model 
as if we would have, were to have observed happiness, and then build it from there. Furthermore, we can come up with even more complex relationships between latent constructs and observed variables. Right? Although we need more variables in our example to do this, we're going to see this this year, but perhaps we, uh, if, has anyone ever heard of the term mediation analyses? Like maybe happiness, happiness mediates the relationship between neuroticism and, I don't know, aggression or something like that, right? What does that mean? Well, it's a very specific type of multivariable relationship that you're able to build into this type of framework itself. So SEM itself is this generalization or this broadening of linear models where we'll have both observed variables and latent variables present. Um, and so I like to think of SEM as part of the bigger picture of linear models themselves because I, I find that there's fewer ceilings to get to when you do that. But you'll see that if you read other SEM texts, SEM is the world that linear models fits into also. But that's what basically what I think of. So here is an example of a path diagram with our regression. It sort of tries to build in, S this is an SEM example that we're going to be getting to here in our last part of the lecture before we get to R. Um, a, a common way of depicting a structural equation model is with this path diagram where we have uh, squares that represent observed variables. So here this is uh, marital status and this is your happiness. This is a path diagram that R drew me and it's not very good. But anyway, uh, if we were to have a latent variable directly in here, although we, we do, happiness is like a construct, but we're using its sum score itself. So that sum score is we're pretending like, hey, we've observed this, when really we didn't. Uh, but if we, if we had it as a construct and left it as that, we'd see a circle in its place. We're going to see that in just a moment. And so then what we're trying to say is, if we're going, what we're, what, when, when you see this arrow here, we have this straight arrow between marital status and happiness, what this indicates is that we think that marital status has a direct effect on happiness. And this arrow has one head, it's called a, so it's this one little arrow right here. That means literally if we were to, uh, if we were to, if this was an experimental setting and we could manipulate these variables, right? We could randomly assign people to marital status. Wouldn't that be terrible? I don't know, I don't know that that would go over well, although I've seen TV shows, right? Isn't there a TV show that was married at first sight recently? I heard about, anyway. I don't have a TV that I watch, or I have a TV, I don't watch it very often, but anyway. Uh, but if we randomly assign that to it, we could think that, we have all other things being equal, that marital status is something that causes happiness, right? If we had a controlled experiment and so forth. It's one of the last times I remember say cause, because this is not where we're going to here. A lot of people like to use cause with SEM. There's no causal in an observational study, and it, we're, only barely there in an experimental study. If and, and everything has to work out just right. So anyway, danger with the word cause, right? Anyway, that is kind of what sh shows up. If we were to do this with a structural equation model where we looked at happiness as latent variable, it, look, it would look more like this. Here's happiness right in the middle. And marital status is really trying to predict a person's happiness itself. But if we could observe this happiness, even though we can't, we could actually use it to predict a person's score on each of the five items of the happiness scale. So when we look at this type of diagram, or this we call this a path diagram here, what this is telling us is these five items right here are the items we put together for our happiness scale. It's the only thing we've observed when it comes to happiness. And if we're right, if these things really do measure happiness, then this type of diagram would show up. Each one of those represents a dependent variable in a regression equation. I mean, there's five regression equations for it. And happiness is the independent variable. It's the thing that's predicting the score for each of those variables. Right? It doesn't exist, but that's our hypothesis about the world. If happiness truly exists and these five items measure it, this is the type of set of regressions that should show up for it. Right? So, Really, we have five separate regressions right here, one, two, three, four, five, and we have a sixth up here, right? 
The five on the bottom are often called a measurement model, it's, and this is sometimes called a confirmatory factor analysis. Yes, Devane. Uh, just, just a curiosity. Yeah. On the notes online, you've got a seventh line that kind of warps its way out from uh, uh -oh. marriage and down to the dotted line for the X1 path. That's is not that good. Anything? No, that should that's a mistake. That shouldn't be there. Yeah, not good. Yeah, there should not be anything right here. That would be really bad. But kind of does this weird like warp and it comes back and connects up with the path on the first path. Oh. One. Yeah. There. There. Yeah. Sorry about that. That shouldn't be anything. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, we have a measurement model here that's that sometimes we call confirmatory factor analysis, and then we have another regression right here that we would actually call a structural equation model where we're predicting this latent variable itself with happiness. But in the bigger picture, what we really have are these five or six equations. These are six regression lines. Right? The regression line for x1 is right here. That's this path. For x2, that's this path, and so forth. And then finally, for the happiness, it's this path right here. Whoops. X1 and X2 and X3 for five for reason for what? These are each of the five items of the survey we gave a person. Their actual score on each of the items themselves. Right. So in this analysis, we took all six of our observed data points for person. Right. We didn't sum the five up. We just said leave them be as they are. We're going to predict them with something that doesn't exist right now. This is a regression line. These Symbols are a little bit different. It's because of the long history of all the regression and factor analysis and everything else. But they function just the same as regression slopes and intercepts. They're going to have labels later on. This is going to be still called an intercept. This thing's called a factor loading. Uh, this happiness right here is a factor. But we do it all simultaneously, all at once, in the analysis. And sure enough, that question that we wanted to answer before, are married people different in their happiness level? still comes from a hypothesis test of beta 1, which is that coefficient right there. Right? So SEM is often called path analysis for latent variables for this point. Path analysis, which we'll see starting in week 4 and 5, is a, sometimes called simultaneous regression. It's multiple regression equations that you do all at once. Path analysis in fields such as uh, econometrics sometimes goes by the term uh, simultaneous variables uh, analysis, uh, and more often than not, does not have any latent variables to it. So structural equation modeling adds the thing that you didn't measure before, happiness, to the model itself. So questions? Weird, huh? But, cool, that's good to hear. So, what, when we do this, though, one thing that we get are for each item, there are these error terms. Right? On this diagram, they're represented by these double arrowed arcs, which is kind of a weird way of drawing it. Other people draw it in other ways. There's probably a different way of drawing it for every person that exists in the world. This is the way that the package in R that I used for it. Anyway. Each of these is the variance. What these represent for each item is an item level measurement error. Right? If this item, x1, this is the first item on that inventory, truly measures happiness, then we could predict, if we could observe happiness, which we can't, but if we could, we would be put this in a regression and predict a person's score, and that's how far off we are from that score. If we're perfectly reliable, we're not off any. If we're not reliable, we're off a lot, right? So that is where measurement error goes. And for each item, because each, items are, each item is something that measures happiness. Sometimes we call these indicators of happiness, right? The item is where measurement error exists now. It's not this unitary thing. You could sort of call it that. We still have error to happiness or variation in happiness. But the measurement error itself shows up for each item. And so what we've done, if you think about our analysis from before, well, we added all these items together to come up with a happiness scaled score, that sum score, 
That's like adding each of these errors together and having it show up in that score too. So that score represented not just happiness, but error. Right? Now, error for each item, or the measurement error, has its spot in analysis. So this factor, if it truly does exist, and it's measured by these items, is it, the factor, the true score itself. Measurement error shows up at the end. The factor may have some variation to it. That's this double-headed arc. That is individual differences. Okay. Measurement error has been disentangled. Or just like you think about an analysis variance, you know how you partition error? Error variance gets partitioned. You have sums of square. Remember analysis variance tables? You had sums of squares between, sums of squares within, blah, blah, blah. That's this right here. Measurement error. Each of these. So now, if if this thing were to be observed, this regression is per is what we would want it to be. It's without error because measurement error has its own spot. It's been disentangled. So that effect of that regression, or this beta 1 at the bottom, the actual label for it, that term will no longer be biased, nor will its standard error be biased. Right? So we have a, should have a better view of whether or not marital status affects happiness. So shall we do that? Actually, we'll do that in just a couple slides. Um, so this, uh, this slide, we basically talked about all this. We, the, the confirmatory factor analysis part I wanted to mention, some of you will go on to take courses called item response theory. That is the same type of depiction, although they never use these in item response theory. Uh, the only thing that differs is what we assume about the variable itself. Typically in this analysis, we, like a linear regression, think this thing's a quantitative or continuous variable. In item response theory, each of these variables may be binary or categorical in some sort. So did you get the item right or wrong or true and false questions that are coded with zeros and ones. So that's where the labels come in. But bigger picture, this is all part of, if, if the way I look at it is down here at the bottom. Each of these is a regression equation. And that's how I think of this that we're doing, right? Some of the regression equations involve things that we can't observe. Those things sometimes get called random effects. But that's about it. How are we doing? All right. Questions? So, would you like to see what happens? I would like to see what happens. I want to zoom. There we go. So, at the top, Right here, this 1.97 right here is our standardized coefficient for our marital happiness. And it's a weird thing to call it standardized, but it really is. Um, this was, remember before it was 0.744 units of y. This is now standardized, but it has the same p-value. Remember our p-value is 0.014 before? When we predict the latent variable of happiness with married, our standardized coefficient is bigger, 0.272. Right? And that's the, the bias I was talking about. Right? When we use a, a, a variable in an analysis like the sum score, this has error in it. Right? So when we use that in the analysis, our estimate is shrunken by the sum score. It's a biased estimate. The other thing that happened, look at this. Our standard error, when we use that, is smaller as well. We've ignored the error in the variable. It's like us saying, we have way more precision than we thought we did. Now, it doesn't look like a lot, but take a look at the p-value right here. So looking at this p-value, which is the effect for the hypothesis test of beta 1, what do you conclude now about the effect of marital status on happiness? No difference. All right. So all of a sudden, this is a different story. And this is the point of this lecture. <laughs> why, do we, why do we use SEM? Because if we have variables in an analysis, oh, I hate when I do that. I don't even know how I did that. Oh, template. Hashtag that, right? <laughs> um, if we have variables in an analysis that may have measurement error to them, we can disentangle the measurement error from the variable we're trying to measure, the construct, and put it into an equation simultaneously. That's, that's the big picture. 
the other, the smaller picture is that if even if we don't uh, have, we we can do things simultaneously. But this is more of a something we call path analysis. So there you have it. So what you see here, uh, the really big picture. And what we're going to get to this year, that slide is going to take us through about the topic list that we get to into, in April. <laughs> All right? All this together, that gets us to early April. And then after that, it's what do we do when we're doing this also? Or what do we do if, you know, you have data where you've already summed up the variable itself? Or you have, you have these sum scores. And you know, the thing that drives me nuts is people collect data and they'll just... They have all the item responses, but somehow they just sum them up and throw away the item responses themselves. That happens a lot, but in this approach, you would never want to do that. But sometimes you have to. And so we'll see that in April and so forth. But here's how I like to think of what drives the process. Um, in each of these slides, all the things that show up are part of, there's, there's, there's something that governs all of it. And those are the, the thing that governs it all are these statistical distributions. And those, uh, we're going to use something like a normal distribution. And so every part of what we just saw show up in a normal distribution. And it governs how we think that our model fits well and what we do to understand whether we, there's a certain step of, set of analysis steps that are governed by this assumption itself. Each of the lines in that path diagram represent parameters that go into this distribution itself, right? If this is normal, there's a mean and the variance some of those parameters may describe one of these variables' variances. Some of them may describe a variable's mean. Right? Some may apply to more than one variable. Um, so what we're going to do to build up to this is to take a, essentially a mini course in distributions and multivariate distributions and maximum likelihood. Because a lot of these things may sound, if you haven't had a course on any of these topics together, they're going to be really out there for SEM, and I think it inhibits understanding why we do certain things. So next week we talk about variable distributions. We go a little bit into multi, to univer, to, to normal distribution and what happens when we have more than one variable. It doesn't look like data at all, but it's building. Right? The week following we talk about how we estimate things with distributions. Because once we understand the distribution, we, it's just a little bit further to understand likelihoods and where this comes from and what we can get from it. And then we dive back into data, but all of a sudden now we have multivariate models. And we have to worry about how we analyze multivariate data first, too. So those are the next three weeks for what we do. So next, we have about 20 minutes left. Do you have questions for me on this? So I wanted to show you really quickly R and R Studio. Uh, and how uh, I intend for you to use them with the homework and so forth. Um, I would mentioned the thing, that the first thing you have to do is download R and download R Studio. Install R first, install R Studio second. And then if you go to our course website, and I'm just going to go to the first homework page because that's where you'll probably be going. Um, our homework doc document you'll see here. We have um, 20 observations with five variables included. ID, whether or not a person's a male, their height in inches, their weight in pounds, and the person's age. And this homework assignment's goal is literally to introduce you to R, R Studio, and this package in R, Levon. That's it. All right, so you can find the homework and download it. Uh, in R itself, what we'll see here, if you download the syntax for this, whoops, I'm going in circles. Um, homework one, you'll see our data file. You'll want to download that. And you'll see this file called starter R syntax file. If you click on it, it takes you, in, if you're in Chrome, it takes you to this weird website. Really, what you want to do is right click it and, down, and download a copy. So if you just right click, uh, save link as, and then you can just save it itself. It'll download. I downloaded it into my downloads folder, and then you have the file, SEM15PRE906 
homework 01 starter. So if you open RStudio, and again, all, all of this you'll find on the video when you come back to it. So you don't have to take notes now, just watch. When you download your stuff, go through these steps. It's the last 20 minutes of class, okay? Um, I did not want to pull up the web page for RStudio. Oh, Windows, you're killing me, man. I'm looking for the fo the program I literally just clicked on earlier today. You, this one. Oh, because I didn't put the space. In RStudio, uh, let me make this bigger so you can see it. You will find the homework file. Uh, you will find you will go into the open folder, find the folder where you downloaded the file. This is the SCM file itself, and open it up, and you'll see it up here on the top left of our studio. That is the syntax part. This is our syntax, and our syntax is really clunky, so I'm trying to keep you from doing a lot of it. You're welcome to do as much of it as you want, but rather than making this a class about R, I'd like to make this a class about SEM, and then R is just how we're using for it. If you want to run this really quick and get the data in, what this syntax does for you is bring in the data and load up the programs that R needs to do SEM for the homework, right? And all of this itself would run it, but there's one catch. You have to tell it where you put the data. When I created this file, my data on my computer are in this path right here. Okay. If you're used to Windows, you'll note the double slashes don't exist in Windows. That's one of the problems in R. One of the first things that I realized that R was very frustrating. Uh, so what you do is you find the folder where you downloaded the data. Here's mine. You click at the top, it doesn't show it to you. Uh, if you right click the file, go to properties, it tells you the folder. Mine is in users teaching download. So you can highlight that and copy it. I can go back to R Studio, and in the console part, R will convert my Windows path or your Mac path to the format it needs. If you type the word read capital clipboard. So R's, R syntax is case sensitive. So you'll see how I type this. It's lowercase read, capital C, lowercase lipboard. <laughs> Open parenthesis, close parenthesis. Clunky. Try to keep you away from it. But if you type that in, it will give you that path to the data. See?